Hey, welcome everyone. Um, thanks everyone for coming for our second community spotlight of the Open Web Foundry. Um, this is our first community spotlight where we have projects from within the actual Open Web Foundry cohort. So the last one we had was um, some of our founders who've been in, who have been our alumni um, and have really important infrastructure tooling. And these are um, some new projects that are going to be looking for feedback, um, collaboration, um, and also you guys can feel free to ask them any questions. Um, after the presentations are over and we'll come into the audience um, as well so we can chat. Um, so without further ado, the first presenter we have is Christian, who's going to be presenting a little bit more about Rorschach. So Christian, um, feel free to tell everybody what Rorschach is and, and any important details that are coming up. Hey, guys. Um, let me share my screen. Can you guys hear me? Can you see this? Yes. Perfect. OK. Um, yeah, so my name is Christian Sumido. I'm the founder of Rorschach. Uh, Rorschach uh, is an, a, a gaming NFT platform. Uh, so what we are trying to solve um, is really the problem in the current Web3 gaming space. Uh, currently, there are a bunch of issues in the Web3 gaming space. Um, at this point, there are a lot of high barriers to entry. Uh, uh, game developers need to learn how to write smart contracts. There's uh, there's not a, not enough tools in the ecosystem. There's no libraries for public game engines. There's just a lot of issues right now. Even though there are a lot of uh, new game new new web three games coming out, a lot of them are are mostly web uh, web based, and there's no uh, there's no real traditional game developers in this space. Um, right now, the, there's very little infrastructure for gamers uh, in the web three space. So Let's say you collect a bunch of assets. The the wallets, for example, aren't very uh, aren't designed for gamers to have a lot of or for users to have, to have a lot of NFTs, a lot of assets. It's still relatively hard to view your your stuff. Um, marketplaces are not designed for gamers. If you want to go buy uh, a bunch, uh, let's say thirty instances of a specific asset in order for you to go and um, in order for you to go and craft stuff, it's uh, you have to go manually, uh, manually uh, fulfill those orders. It, it, there's still a lot of missing infrastructure in this space, and play to earn is currently the only model. Oh, it's not. Oh, my bad. It's not changing screen. My bad. Is that a, is that better? That's my mistake. Um, sorry. No, it's good. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, play to earn is the only model out there. Um, the problem with that is not every game is going to be able to implement play to earn. So. Uh, single player based games, experience based games, simulation based games, those games are never going to be able to um, enter the blockchain space because uh, it, it doesn't fit the play to earn model. So, Rorschach, oh, oh I, I, sorry, I, I made a mistake. Sorry about that. All good. I think the slides were were fine. Yeah. yeah so really we haven't seen the uh, this what is Rorschach slide yet. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, Rorschach. So what we're we, uh, for all this, uh, the problems we're trying to solve. Rorschach is a decentralized gaming platform that empowers gamers through enabling cross game interoperable assets and building a sustainable global game, gaming ecosystem. So the goal for the project is to build um, a new type of economic model based off of um, cross game interoperable assets, which means assets that I collect as a gamer collect from one game, I'm able to use in a different game. So what this means is it's more inclusive to, um, it, to, to all games as opposed to just games that are applicable to play to earn. Um, and that what that builds is a more uh, interesting and wide ranging um, gaming ecosystem where, uh, where each game becomes a small world that's attached to a global eco network of games as opposed to uh, each game trying to build their own ecosystem and trying to fight against other other games to acquire gamers. Um, so what we have right now are uh, an end to end solution from uh, game engine libraries and tools to the back end, which is the decentralized smart contracts and the central uh, and the, uh, the smart contracts and the decentralized infrastructure. And then um, the gaming marketplace where it where it becomes a uh, a global liquidity liquidity asset pool so uh, all the all the assets uh in all the games connected to, to the ecosystem 
have access to this marketplace and pro can provide liquidity uh, and uh, decentralized applications for the gamers and the content creators. Uh, what that actually means um, is that the Rorschach platform is built on a uh, on, on the concept of a cross cross game assets, and what we're trying to launch with our um, uh, mar a gaming marketplace, an NFT uh, inventory system, and personalized assets that are dedicated to uh, that, are, that are familiar to what gamers ex have already experienced in games such as MMORPGs, um, which allow which give us a, ver a very good um, user experience that gamers are already used to. Um, and what we're trying to work towards down the line are more uh, ecosystem and community-based uh, projects on top of the platform, such as uh, esports and rewards tools, guild, uh, guild worlds, which are um, which are uh, creative worlds where guilds can come together and create their own world based off of the asset set that their guild members have collected. And then uh, obviously a contact verification system because currently uh, assets in this space uh, technically can still be uh, copied and we would want to offer a, uh, a verification system kind of like giving uh, original assets the uh, like a like a Twitter blue check mark something like that um, so with that said uh, I'd like to start with a demo so the demo is going to be uh, we're going to show off our, our our front end and the uh, the, the capabilities of uh, interoperable assets uh, let me just move that over real quick. Uh, here we go. So this is our front end. Um, right now, all we really have for gamers are uh, inventory screen, which uh, is not, not yet super complete, and the marketplace where you can buy assets, let's say, um, buy assets uh, that are on the marketplace. So let's buy one of these. Oh. Well. Well, first of all, actually, I want to sh also show the game developer mode. So in the game developer mode, um, the, the the game developer the content, uh, or the uh, content creator can deploy their own smart contracts. Um, and then once they've deployed their own smart contracts for their collection, they can deploy different types of assets. Right now, we support um, text-based assets, uh, audio-based assets, image-based assets, uh, imagery assets and static 3D objects. Um, these are the asset frameworks that we have so far. Um, and hopefully down the line, we would be creating more interesting asset frameworks that allow cross game interoperability, such as um, uh, characters, uh, character skins, uh, attachables like guns, hats, backpacks, um, emotes, animations like emotes and poses and stuff like that. Ho so ho hopefully down the line, we will create more of that, more uh, frameworks like that. So. What I want to show is the uh, asset framework, or sorry, the a asset viewer which runs our uh, our backend, our sorry, gaming libraries. So what this shows is um, the capabilities of our S gaming SDKs as well as the cross game asset interoperability. So let me just log in there. And so once we've logged in using our mobile wallet, what this is doing now is um, is downloading the oops, is downloading all the no assets. Uh, okay, maybe reload. Oh, apologies. I'm on the wrong. I'm on the wrong wallet. Apologies. Not that wallet. Um, sorry about that, guys. Uh, there we go. The demo gods have um, have yeah. striked again. <laughs> Always, always the case. Sorry, it's that just downloading. So what this is showing is it's downloading the necessary assets from Arweave. So all of these assets are stored on Arweave. And what this is showing is that we're able to view different types of uh, assets that are uh, up to the up to the standard. Um, so there's text assets up here, um, image assets here, 
audio assets here. If you click this, ooh, it's still loading. Challenge accepted. And 3D static assets. Uh, let's see. Um, tree. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. So what this is showing is that uh, it gives it shows the the ability of the uh, cross game assets and for gamers, I guess our game developers and content creators to upload the different types of assets, which they can be used for, let's say, re uh, reward systems, uh, achievements, um, tournament rewards, stuff like that. And game gamers can take these assets wherever they go, assuming those games support the, the framework. Um, yeah, so that's the, uh, that's the, oops. Cool. That's the demo. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we are currently fundraising, and we're hopefully uh, in the next few months we'll be hiring. So if you guys are interested in uh, the project, please, please feel free to reach out. Um, contact me at Rorschach.io. The alpha project that you saw earlier was at alpha.rorschach.io. Uh, yeah, please follow us on Twitter, and uh, hopefully we'll see you see you soon. Thanks, Christian. Is there anything um, people can do now to help contribute to Rorschach? Is uh, I saw there was an alpha testnet link there. Yeah, for sure. Um, so if you go, oh, let me. Yeah, so if you go to uh, alpha.rorschach.io, um, there's instructors, uh, and you're able to connect. You can test out our project, um, play around with, uh, buy some assets with uh, with testnet ETH and uh, testnet testnet DAI, and then uh, play around with the, the asset framework. It gives us more data on like the the what types of uh, what types of uh, computers can or cannot access the framework, and then we can tweak the framework as necessary. Um, you can also play around with the developer, launch your own assets, um, play around, uh, launch your own smart contracts, and then launch your own assets. Um, yeah, uh, there's if you go to Rorschach.io, there's instructions uh, or sorry, there's tutorials there as well, and. Uh, links to documentation for uh, accessing it. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I just put the link alpha.rorschach.io in the chat there. So um, if anyone wants to help um, contribute to this project and, and test things out, then you can go there. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. and uh, participating in the alpha gets you uh, a chance to receive uh, Roar tokens down the line when we launch our company. Yeah. Okay, perfect. perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Um, okay, perfect. And then next up, we're going to have Nadav, who's going to be presenting um, HS Credit. Um, so Nadav, if you can come up to one of the microphones here and, and uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're working on. Hey. I think your mic is muted. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And I am just going to pop this in the chat so you have it there and share. Okay. Looks good. Um, okay. So my name is Nadav Zemmer. Um, and I'm going to drop right in because I can move pretty quickly through this. I'm presenting high school credit, uh, an NFT based high school transcript system. Um, so the problem we're solving is that state controlled credits are kind of like state controlled money. They're easy to issue and they issue more and more of them. So the incentives right now in state controlled credits is each politician wants to show graduation rates increasing. So they keep watering down and printing credits more easily. The public high school transcript is becoming increasingly irrelevant unless you go to a name brand school. Um, I'm gonna skip that for now for the sake of time, but you can see we're spending more and more and, it, and this doesn't show what happened during the pandemic, which actually doubled. So we actually um, exponentially more money and getting no results for that. Um, and right now, if you don't go to the right elementary school, essentially by five or six years old, you're not on the right track. You can't pivot when you're 16 because you're not going to be in the right type of high school and your transcript won't be recognized. Um, and then there's an issue of social relevance right now with standardized testing. We're testing for standardized thinking and standardized thinking is really the type of thinking that AI is doing. So we're testing who's going to be the best at jobs that no longer exist. So the more that high schools fail to teach kids skills that are relevant to digital age, they function to warehouse kids. 
And so they depend compliance in the absence of engagement. So in low income inner city schools, we're really creating kind of a prison to, you know, school to prison pipeline and teaching students how to survive in that context, but not in the um, you know, digital age where they have to learn how to do work rather than just holding down a job and do what they're told. So if standardized thinking isn't any um, isn't relevant anymore, we still need accountability data. And so high school credit as an app provides a gold standard educational uh, data framework. Um, so it's a progressive web app, high school transcript. And just like Bitcoin um, or any cryptocurrency is a ledger, is a simple ledger of accounts, the high school transcript is a simple ledger of accounts. Um, each credit is evaluated by a committee of three credit experts who are paid 180 bucks an hour to do that evaluation. And that eliminates cheating on both sides. It's actually 20 times harder for a student to cheat on, on this type of exam, uh, this type of assessment, project-based assessment. And also the politicians can't cheat. We're taking the power from the politicians and putting in the hands of a community of educators. Um, so all the data is based on performance-based assessment. This is the ancient type of learning that happened before the industrial age that, um, you know, kind of how the brain works best and um, brain research now is showing that this type of project-based learning is the deeper type of learning. So our data is a gold standard data because we're, um, we're assessing student work products rather than um, standardized test thinking. Um, any student at any school can access this app. So now we've leveled the playing field so that uh, any student at age 16 can pivot and compete on an equal playing field to um, students at any other school. Um, and this is based on two decades of work that we've done in America's largest school district here in New York City. Uh, it's an app we're talking about. Um, it's a pretty simple app. We have a proprietary um, system of uh, inverted credit accumulation where you cram for the test at the beginning of a unit to gain access to the credit rather than the end. I recommend you read my Medium article that I posted in the chat. Um, it goes into much more detail about how an inverted credit system works. So um, without going into too much detail, this is what the transcript that you generate looks like. And we have these QR codes so that anybody, it's kind of our proof of work system. Anybody can scan the QR code on a transcript to see the work that went into earning that credit. Um, and there's more I can share about that, but I will uh, leave it there. We have an exceptional team. Um, I, I could speak about a number of these people, but these are people that have been working on uh, alternatives to standardized tests, some of them for three or four decades. Um, it's a, and we have an incredibly diverse team and incredibly, uh, some, of the people, some of my heroes have joined the team, which is exciting for me. The whole journey started with a book that I wrote at the beginning of the pandemic, Education in the Digital Age, How We Get There. Um, and then we have this roadmap right now. We're actually ahead of schedule. We've already raised $150,000 um, for the nonprofit. And uh, we have schools signed up for our beta testing sites. And we have a number of um, two pretty exciting partnerships that we hope to announce in the coming months. Um, so we're ahead of schedule and we're hoping actually to move the date up for the invite only beta to 2023. Um, but we are a slow moving team because we're bootstrapped, we're self funded. Um, so we're right now still aiming for 2024. Um, the gaps to making that happen and moving the um, uh, moving the timeline forward is really human resources. Um, we don't have anybody on the NFT or DAO side, so the blockchain side. We need a leadership, uh, somebody to step into leadership there. Um, and we have a number of other roles available. We have detailed job descriptions for any of those roles that we can share. Um, you can contact me, um, z at HS Credit is my email, and then on socials, either at Principal Z or N Zemmer. And I will leave it there and, um, you know, enjoy connecting with you guys off stage after this um, to answer more detailed, specific questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Nadev. That was a very, very quick, very educational presentation. Um, and yeah, I think we're all very excited to see the world of accreditations be decentralized not monopolized by um you know centralized institutions so it's very good what you're doing um thank you very much um perfect and then next up we're going to have um kieran who's going to be presenting joint investment dao um so kieran you could step up to one of the podiums here and and we can get started Hey, Kieran. Hey. Uh, all right. I hope everyone can see my screen. Yep. We see also your uh, your presenter notes there. Oh, okay. sorry. Um, <clears throat> all 
perfect. Looks good. All right. So, you know, my project is called Joint Investments DAO. Um, so, in a nutshell, um, yeah, we aim to become the first decentralized VC fund, giving uh, seed capital and startup funds to businesses located in the United States um, that were founded by entrepreneurs who were formerly incarcerated for nonviolent cannabis charges. Um, so we would only basically we would be using a submission based system um, where potential entrepreneurs could submit their business plans to us. Um, and mostly we would be aiming to fund people who otherwise would not have the startup capital to be taking on such an endeavor. Um, but we'd only be able to accept submissions from states and territories in the US where marijuana is both recreationally and medicinally legal. Um, so we would also want to network with organizations with similar missions um, because there are nonprofits that have grant-based programs to sort of carry out similar things. But the issue with um, with the nonprofit grant-based model, uh, which I mean, obviously more, more power to them and I respect the hell out of that mission, but they, um, Basically, they usually rely on wealthy benefactors or, you know, just individual donations in order to fund um, in order to fund businesses. And um, also because of that, largely, they're usually not able to give out a significant portion of startup capital. It's usually only like, you know, a few percent of what the, start the startup amount would be for such a business, which can range anywhere from. 150,000 to a million dollars, depending on if it's a dispensary or a grow operation. Um, but basically what we would be doing is um, using our model, we'd have investment analysts um, basically look at uh, our submissions and then submit, submit the top five to 10 uh, submissions that we get to the community for a greater, to the greater community for a vote. Um, and essentially we could then take our profits from that and pay out our investors who would basically have a small share in each company and also then use the collective DAO profits to then fund more businesses. Um, and essentially we could just keep on growing as, a, as marijuana becomes legal in more states and territories. Um, so the team, Blazin, that's me. Uh, Bazu Mafongo, these are all aliases, of course, um, is, are our investment analysts. Um, Ray Kinney's the visuals uh, marketing specialist. And Andrew, um, he's our cannabis industry expert. He uh, owns several smoke shops and a couple dispensaries and sort of is like an individual investor within the, within the, um, within the sphere. Um, so yeah, here's our proposal link. Um, and I can also put this in the chat. Um, and here's our email uh, if anyone's interested in more information. And I mean, basically, uh, we have all the moving parts that we need other than a lead developer, which obviously is very crucial here. Um, and I have not yet really been able to find someone um, who I am confident in in helping us develop our application. So if anyone out there is interested, in uh in working with us then by all means reach out and i'll be out i'll be here for a little bit after too so uh don't hesitate to reach out basically our application um i think would be relatively simple we uh we would be able to use community.xyz that uh, jesse shared with me to for some of the um aspects like for the voting protocols for example um but we would probably need our own separate application likely for um you know for the ability to view business metrics to view uh, individual metrics like uh, you know ownership in each company and whatnot um, and I, I don't think all of that could be achieved with the with the framework cut out for us so um, so yeah perfect thank you um, yeah if you don't mind also just sharing that drive link in the in the chat as well and the email just so everybody can see um, if yeah, they want to get in yeah. touch and then also, yeah, like you mentioned, we're all going to be hanging out afterwards. So if anyone um, has any questions for the founders, it's uh, just come up and ask. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Karen. Uh, OK, and for our last presenter of the evening or afternoon, depending on where you are, um, we're going to have Rare Candy um, and Ross is going to be presenting that. Um, 
And Ross, you can come up to one of the um, microphones here. And Kieran, could you just walk back to the backstage? Yeah, sorry. Hey, Ross. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, let me cut straight to it. So I'm Ross from Rare Candy. We are a virtual publishing house of uh, scarce physical and digital collectibles. At least this is how we started. And we're now kind of rebranding and kind of revamping our project into something more specific after being in the scene for uh, a couple of years. Uh, we've been here since early 2020. Uh, Self-funded, uh, so now we are uh, looking for some funding to kind of uh, manifest our vision that I'm happy to share with you today. So uh, you will notice that we are new. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, do you mean to be sharing your screen right now? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I guess you don't see it. Apologies. All right, can you see it? Yeah, looks good. Awesome. So Rare Candy 3D, the, the next generation entertainment platform. And this sounds like very simple, but for us, it's important because we came to the conclusion that uh, instead of using like fancy terms and hot words, buzzwords like NFTs or Web3 or stuff like that, uh, we wanted to kind of uh, explain to my father, let's say, or explain like to somebody who's not familiar at all with this tech uh, or the scene, like what exactly is it, it is we are doing, because it's not that we're just releasing art. It's not that we just release music or just fashion wearables, whether we're talking about digital or physical collectibles, but we kind of uh, try to level up the experience for the user, uh, whether that's like a virtual environment, it can be like a metaverse event or like a metaverse presentation. It can be like uh, sharing your physical wearables in the digital world or like your avatar can wear the clothes you wear in real life, uh, but also kind of still releasing our uh, line of curated uh, original Rare Candy NFTs. So um, Rare Candy is driven by innovation since day one. So we were always tackling like what's possible with NFTs, but not just from a tech standpoint. We were thinking like, how can we create like a, for example, a visual distinction of uh, on, on top of our NFT so that people while scrolling in the marketplace, they can know that, hey, this is a rare candy NFT. So we came up with watermarks, we came up with RFID chips uh, uh, that we're using in some of our physical releases. Um, we have released uh, a couple of uh, actually like more specifically three 12 inch record vinyls uh, through Ethereal Audio, uh, a record label we are distributing through Rare Candy. And we're working on a bunch of uh, metaverse tools and services. We have our own uh, gallery in uh, crypto voxels, and we'll tr we'll, we are trying to expand in uh, the central and, and Somnium space as well, but also in Web2 metaverses like VRChat and Rec Room, uh, where they might not have um, you know crypto wallets and stuff like that, but I think they have uh, already like a very big and established crowd. Uh, for example, VRChat has like 60,000 plus active monthly users, while maybe on crypto boxes, we, even in the biggest gatherings, you might see like 100 people, 200. I think the record was 400 or something at a crazy event. Uh, so we're not discriminating. We're, we're not trying to play the crypto card. He's saying like, hey, we're the next uh, unicorn that's all about crypto and web free and stuff like that. But we want to be more inclusive. Uh, so the problem with NFTs for us, for uh, Rare Candy, is that at the moment, most of them are uh, representing digital art. Uh, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, considering that it's easy to create digital art and upload it. It's not that you have to carry a physical painting or decide what kind of fabric you're going to use for clothes and stuff like that. But I believe that anyone who spends some time in the NFT scenes would... Uh, consider this as an unavoidable fact that uh, we will start to see more sophisticated use cases, uh, obviously, like from the ones we mentioned before, like fashion, music, uh, movies, video games, stuff like that. But even far-fetched scenarios uh, like uh, designer babies or designer specimens trapped as NFTs, uh, where people could buy genetic traits and stuff like that. Um, 
so why are we pointing at the entertainment market like nfts are cool they have like 40 billion but if you look at the broader entertainment market you'll see that it's much much larger and i believe i'm convinced that most of these assets will if not uh, become nfts they will have some sort of a digitally verifiable ownership protocol where whatever that might be and so far it seems that nfts are the best uh, form to do that uh, whether again whether we talk about movies music uh, all sorts of art or creative uh, products uh, what rare candy have been doing from day zero is that we are uh, trying to have a personal relationship with all our uh, roster artists so we uh, talk to them one on one. We provide uh, advice. We provide them with uh, tools. We even provide them with advances to buy musical instruments or to book a studio time. Uh, and obviously, like we pay for their gas fees and everything, so that it for for them it's a seamless um, interaction. They don't have to learn about how to do all that stuff. They don't have to have like two three hundred bucks to pay for the gas fees. Like in in some cases, some regions of the world, this is more than a monthly wage. So we try to kind of cherry pick the artists we like and release something very unique, something with a compelling story, something that looks nice, feels nice, uh, maybe listens nice if it's music. Uh, and in the new platform, like so far, as I told you, um, Rare Candy was a virtual publishing house. And so far, the platform we have is kind of like a portal where you can uh, find gateways to different marketplaces where available that would be currently in all the popular ones like OpenSea, Rarible, uh, Looks Rare, Cargo, Minbase. Uh, again, because we don't want to discriminate, we don't want to say like, hey, we're exclusively on Foundation or on Super Rare. We want to be everywhere if possible, right? And so in the new platform, we will have our own marketplace where we kind of took some time to think about what we would like to see in this marketplace as users. First of all, we advise with our uh, top collectors, like some of them are pretty big names. Also, our community is very packed, like uh, we are backed by guys like uh, the founders of Rarible, um, Sven, uh, who is like uh, Bulwash33, I think is his name, his crypto name. He's like the biggest uh, virtual estate whale in crypto voxels. I think he owns like uh, around 2,000 parcels or something. It's crazy. Uh, so some, most of our NFTs are uh, collected by some really, really interesting figures. Again, also we are a very small uh, community. So by listening to these guys, we came up with some visual uh, indicators as, as to what we would you know, expect from a platform, for example, something very simple, self-explanatory, like checking the floor price of an NFT uh, on top of the card while you're scrolling, while you're browsing the marketplace, instead of having to click inside the NFT and then click on the contract and then check the floor price. So we think this kind of uh, data is very important for users for the, on the first glimpse. So we try to create like the marketplace tailored for collectors and not so much uh, for the artists. As so far with uh, every artist we work with, we have like a personal relationship. So each release, uh, it's completely different. Uh, we also want to create a secondhand marketplace. Uh, this is probably going to be one of our gems. It's not something crazy, I think. Many people have thought about this. But uh, the idea here is basically to give collectors the ability to list uh, either like single NFTs or like create bundles of NFTs with custom descriptions, similar to what you would see on eBay or Facebook Marketplace. Uh, so for example, I'm selling a CryptoPunk. If I sold it on Rarible or on OpenSea or on any other marketplace, like but potential buyers would see the same image and the same description that comes from the metadata of the NFT. So in this case, we're not changing the metadata. This is not possible, but we create like, we give these collectors a second layer, like a web two layer, a page that's kind of like a traditional listing saying like, hey, I'm selling this bunch of crypto punks because I have to pay my rent on a good price, blah, blah, blah. So I, I think this is very important. This is gonna change a lot of things and obviously it's gonna be open source. Uh, we expect everyone to adapt to something like this. And we are also working on an NFT media player uh, in association with LexDAO and Layer 3 Technologies, uh, kind of like an advisory firm from the US. 
And again, this is very self-explanatory. If you're in the scene for some time or if you collect music NFTs, it would make absolute sense because so far, in order to listen to your music, you have to open like 20 different tabs uh, and then click stop and play in each uh, different tab. While I think we should have like a universal player that kind of picks the data from your wallet and plays everything with some basic audio functions like next, stop, pause, repeat, and stuff like that. Um, so we have the Rave Candy token. This is uh, have uh, have been online since uh, late 2020. We created this through Roll Social Money Token Issuance Platform. And um, I'm not gonna go into details. Uh, I'm not gonna pitch to you guys like uh, you know exactly what, what's happening. But just to kind of give you an understanding of uh, how we are trying to raise, we created, we came up with a way that's called uh, NCO or NFT coin offering. And basically, if you have used the role, you know like how claimable links work, and we basically trap claimable links of specific amount of tokens, ERC-20 tokens, inside these NFTs as unlockables. So basically, uh, an investor would buy one of these NFTs and instantly unlock the tokens he's invested uh, in. Uh, so th this has a lot of reasoning behind. <clears throat> I'm not able to elaborate that, but I will be happy to share the deck and our Discord for whoever wants to learn more about Rare Candy. I will be happy to elaborate. But in a nutshell, we are doing this to kind of filter out the investor crowd because we think that if you are able to buy an nft you are really an nft person like you you have already done this or at least you feel comfortable with this so by investing in rare candy you should be somewhat familiar with nfts you can't be just like a random vc that hears nft and just wants to dump money you know so we're really going for the long run here we want strong uh partners on our side and people who can bring value to the project and our vision uh, as we see it. Uh, roadmap, not going to go into this, but again, you can take your time and check it uh, after I uh, share the, the, the deck. And uh, you can find also contact details and everything. But uh, just uh, uh, just for this event, I'm going to drop the deck and the Discord link. And if you have any questions, I'll be here after they went to connect and answer or exchange ideas on anything. Thanks a lot for your time, everyone. Perfect. Us, ninety-five percent of NFTs are tied to digital art. That's crazy. Uh, I didn't Indeed. realize that. I don't think it'll stay like that for long. But no way. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> no way. Um, also, you've quite a lot of tabs up there. It's. Uh, <laughs> I'm surprised yeah. you could even run the presentation. Um, but yes, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna do the mingle session now, so we'll all come down into the audience area. So thank you to the presenters. Thank you to the audience. Thank you, everybody, um, for coming up. Um, and we'll see you down there in a second. Cheers.